President Trump tells the General Services Administration to begin the transition process for Joe Biden. Biden picks his cabinet, and it's all D.C. establishment insiders, and Democrats push more COVID lockdowns, but not for themselves. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. Today's show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Thousands of my listeners have already secured their internet. Join them at expressvpn.com. Slash Ben, we'll get to all the news in just one moment. First, let's talk about how you can save a bunch of money for it yourselves. It's not even Black Friday yet, but you can save yourself hundreds of dollars a year. How? Well, you can cut down on that cell phone bill. The reality is you are spending way too much for your cell phone coverage. The reason is you are paying for unlimited data. You're not using unlimited data. The cell phone companies know this. They charge you for unlimited data anyway. Instead, you should check out Pure Talk USA. Pure Talk is a veteran-run wireless company. Think AT&T, but much better. If you're with Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, you're paying Way too much money. Pure and simple. Pure Talk can easily save you over 400 bucks a year. Here's all you need. Unlimited talk, text, and two gigs of data for just 20 bucks a month. If you go over on data usage, they don't charge you for it. Switching to Pure Talk is the easiest decision you will make today. You'll save yourself a bunch of money and you have the same great coverage that you get from the other cell phone companies. Same towers, same sort of cell phone coverage. Grab your mobile phone. Dial pound 250. Say Ben Shapiro. When you do, you save 50% off your first month. Dial pound 250. Say keyword Ben Shapiro. Pure Talk is simply smarter wireless. Go check them out right now. Dial pound 250. Say my name, Ben Shapiro, and you save 50% off your first month and you're going to be saving a bunch of money going forward. Check out my friends at Pure Talk U. USA by dialing pound 250 and saying my name, Ben Shapiro. Okay, so late last night, President Trump tweeted out that he was going to allow Emily Murphy, who is the head of General Services Administration, to move forward with the transition for Joe Biden. This doesn't mean he has dropped his legal challenges. It does mean that he is not going to be, as I've suggested before, holing up in the Oval Office, snorting blow and firing machine guns through the door, a la the, the most fevered fantasies of the members of the media. This was always a fantasy. Members of the media were under the grave misimpression that President Trump was going to string barbed wire around the White House and they were going to get the glorious image of people with uniforms and guns going in and frog marching Trump out of the White House. This was always wish fulfillment by Democrats. It was always fantasy by Democrats. And President Trump blew up that fantasy last night when he said, listen, you know, my legal stru- my legal challenges are still ongoing here, but there will be an orderly transition of power no matter what happens. He tweeted out, I want to thank Emily Murphy at GSA for her steadfast dedication and loyalty to our country. She's been harassed, threatened, and abused. And I do not want to see this happen to her, her family, or employees of GSA. Our case strongly continues. We will keep up the good fight. I believe we will prevail. Nevertheless, in the best interest of our country, I'm recommending that Emily and her team do what needs to be done with regard to initial protocols and have told my team to do the same, which of course is the appropriate move, right? He gets to move forward with all of his legal challenges. This thing doesn't get voted on until December 14th. He gets to move forward and show whatever evidence he has in court. The cases are not going well so far, but theoretically they could reverse. But in the meantime, he is not holding up the transition of power that is supposed to happen. Now, the way the Washington Post suggests is that Emily Murphy had done something deeply wrong by not starting the transition earlier. The problem, of course, is that none of the states had certified their votes as of last week. Now the states are starting to certify their votes. The electors don't even meet until the middle of December. So she really did not have any legal grounds to do so without the formal concession of the president of the United States in the race. She is a a person who holds a government office and she is bound by the law. And until the president concedes, which basically makes everything else a formality, she can't start the transition. Trump giving her permission to start the transition allows the process to go forward. The Washington Post, of course, plays this as though she had done something deeply wrong by not unilaterally starting the transition, even though she really does not have the power legally to do so. According to the Washington Post, Murphy, a by-the-book expert in federal procurement policy, consulted with her senior staff and her attorneys. The transition law dating to 1963 that was supposed to guide her in determining when a candidate had won had little to offer in the current case with the president refusing to concede and a Republican Party standing by him. Well, no, actually, it's just that the legal process moving forward was just supposed to be that the votes get certified and none of the states had certified their votes yet. So again, if Trump had conceded, then she would have moved the transition forward. Now he's given her permission. And so she's moving the transition forward. The media are trying to play this as though Trump was trying to stop her from moving the transition forward. That's not right. He just was not giving her the permission to move the transition forward, which was necessary because she doesn't have any other legal authority. She does work for the executive branch. She did write a letter to Joe Biden. And she said, I've dedicated much of my adult life to public service. I've always strived to do what is right. Please know I came to my decision independently based on the law and available facts. I was never directly or indirectly pressured by any executive branch official, including those who work at the White House or GSA, with regard to the substance or timing of my decision. To be clear, I did not receive any direction to delay my determination. She said she received a lot of threats. She said, I always remain committed to upholding the law. Of course, it is her job to make sure that Post-election resources and services are available to assist in the event of a presidential transition. But of course, 
the media declaring somebody president-elect does not formally make them by law president-elect of the United States. So in any in any case, the, the transition is beginning to move forward. In the meantime, President Trump continues to move forward with his legal challenges. That pathway continues to narrow. Last night, the Michigan State Board of Canvassers voted to certify the state's election results. That is a, a, a board that is made up of two Republicans and two Democrats. One of the two Republican members of the Michigan State Canvassing Board, Aaron Van Langveld, joined the two Democrats to vote to certify the election results. So apparently it went three to one. The state's highly anticipated certification was the latest in a series of episodes over the past week that have reinforced Biden's victory, even as Trump has refused to concede. This is according to, of course, CNN. Also in Pennsylvania, the state Supreme Court rejected the Trump campaign's effort to block the counting of certain absentee ballots, clearing the way for votes to be certified in multiple counties, including Philadelphia. Uh, the county of uh, the county that includes Philadelphia did certify its vote last night. And of course, last week, the Republican governor and secretary of state in Georgia certified the state's election results, although there will be another recount that is going to happen in Georgia as well. The Georgia secretary of state's office, according to Daily Wire, announced the additional recount on Monday evening during a press conference. The Trump campaign criticized Georgia's first recount, which took place over the course of last week and uncovered two errors worth thousands of votes each on Saturday. The Trump campaign is legally entitled to a recount upon request with the cost of such an operation covered by Georgia state and local governments, according to Politico. The Trump campaign is calling for some sort of re-examination of the ballot based on the signatures on the mail ballot envelopes. That's going to be kind of difficult because originally when you look at the mail ballot envelopes, the signatures are compared and then the envelopes are thrown away. So it's not like that evidence still exists at this point. Georgia is going to end up certifying the election. Meanwhile, the Trump campaign continues to try and, and move forward with its own legal theory. Rudy Giuliani spelled out that legal theory a little bit yesterday. We'll get to that in just one moment. First, let us talk about great watches. So I'm a watch guy, right? I own a bunch of really luxury watches, but luxury watches cost a fortune. They cost an arm and a leg. And you can get a great watch at an affordable price, like a really nice looking, durable, excellent. I mean, th these watches are great. I'm talking about Vincero watches. Check this one out. Vincero, they are dedicated to the craft. They put the time and effort into crafting timepieces that you can wear day after day. Head over to VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro. That is V-I-N-C-E-R-O Watches.com slash Shapiro. It makes a great gift for Hanukkah, for Christmas. Avoid that rush of last minute gifts and shop their sale right now. I talk about the brand because I believe in the products that they make. I've been wearing Vincero watches when I'm with my kids and I don't want to damage my more expensive watches. So instead I wear this and they haven't damaged them because they're incredible. These watches are just great. They run fantastically well. They are, as I say, very durable. They look great. I mean, this looks like a luxury watch and it does not cost what a luxury watch costs. It's not gonna cost you thousands of dollars. Vincero offers free shipping, 30-day returns, guarantees your watch for two years. They believe in doing things the right way so their customers get the best and never have to settle. That's why they have 25,000 five-star reviews. You're not gonna get a watch made this well for this kind of price anywhere else. My listeners have been the hero for Vincero this year. Seriously, the folks at Vincero told me they are grateful for support from Ben Shapiro Show listeners. So please keep the emails, messages, and letters going and keep supporting the businesses that support this show. Head on over to VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro for Vincero's biggest sale of the year. That is V-I-N-C-E-R-O, VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro. Go to my link and pick out your favorite watch. Get a great discount right now. VinceroWatches.com slash Shapiro. Go check them out right now. Okay, so Rudy Giuliani is uh, struggling to sort of explain the legal strategy moving forward. So obviously the Trump legal team dumped Sidney Powell the other day because Sidney Powell had been making wilder and wilder accusations about the hacking of voting machines. And the suggestion was, was that millions of votes were switched. Trump had won 80 million votes, not 73 million votes, that the Dominion voting machines had actually been hacked because Smartmatic was originally a Venezuelan company. It was, it was a, a bit of an extreme theory. And then she got even more extreme, suggesting that basically candidates were paying Dominion in order to hack into the machines, or they'd been paid by Dominion to allow the hacking of the machines. And so just a couple of days ago, the Trump campaign dumped Sidney Powell on the side of the road, and they said, we are no longer working with her. And then she said she's still going to release a Kraken. This time, the Kraken is going to be taking steroids, as well as presumably some other form of analgesic. So that's exciting stuff. Uh, Rudy Giuliani was with Lou Dobbs. He was asked specifically, why did you dump Sidney Powell? Here was his answer. I think it's because we're pursuing two different theories. Our, uh, our theory of the case to get to the Supreme Court now in four places, and it's soon going to be in two others, and there'll be an overall lawsuit, is uh, basically uh, misconduct of the election by state officials in at least five or six different states in which the misconduct of the election involved deprivation of constitutional rights for the president. Okay, he then added that they still have a legal strategy. That strategy is 
you know, looking at the various voter irregularities and voter fraud cases, uh, the big problem, again, as it was in Pennsylvania, is going to be proving that the voter irregularities and the voter process, the voter fraud cases, that those amount to enough of a problem that state election results as currently counted should be overturned. This was the problem in Pennsylvania where a couple of affidavits in which people said that their ballots weren't properly counted. The proper remedy would be to have their ballots counted, not to invalidate millions of votes. This is what the judge in that particular case said. They have the same problem in Michigan. Presumably, they'll have the same problem in Wisconsin, Arizona, and Nevada, wherever else they decide to file these lawsuits. You have to show that the voter fraud and voter regularity, the proper remedy would be to set aside the election result and instead have the state lawmakers select the electors to the Electoral College. That is the burden. Uh, Rudy is suggesting that basically they're one good case away from turning this whole thing around. The facts are there. We just need to get them uh, before a trier of fact or before a court that will be fair and we'll listen to them. I mean, the court, the court in Pennsylvania cut it off without listening to a single fact. And I don't know how, how the judge could have concluded that the facts aren't substantial when they haven't even been presented yet. <laughs> They're really kind mm -hmm. of, and on a motion to dismiss, well, you're not supposed to consider that. So you're, you're uh, yeah. unfortunately, we haven't yet got a, well, gotten a fair decision. We will, we gotta be a little patient, one fair decision, one good hearing, and this will turn oh. all around. Okay, so the legal process continues to work. This is why the Trump team has filed a lawsuit uh, with the Third Circuit Court of Appeals asking for leave to amend their original complaint in that district court and then be remanded back to district court. So it's going to go back down before it goes back up. All of the states are going to certify by December 8th. So obviously the timeline here is quite short. Meanwhile, there have been calls from some people like Lynn Wood in Georgia for Republicans in Georgia to somehow boycott the Georgia senatorial election, which is the dumbest thing I have ever heard in my entire life. Okay, If you're a Republican in Georgia and you're angry about President Trump's treatment and you believe that President Trump was somehow jobbed in Georgia, OK, I don't see how the solution is for you to boycott an election in which two Democrats could be elected. John Ossoff, a radical progressive, and Raphael Warnock, who's an actual nut. They could be elected and they could theoretically give if, if one of them, if both of them were elected, Democrats would then have a 50 50 split in the Senate of the United States. And if Joe Biden ends up taking office on January 20th, which right now it appears he probably will. If that happens, then Joe Biden ends up presiding over a, de a Democrat-run Senate with Kamala Harris breaking the tie. If you are a Republican in Georgia, get your ass out and vote. Vote right now. If you can vote right now, vote right now. If you can vote mail-in, vote mail-in. If you can vote early, vote early. Vote right now. Do not put like, the, and you know who else is saying this? It's not just me. Donald Trump Jr. is saying this is nuts. Now he's saying, if you, if you think that you're helping my dad somehow by not voting in the Georgia senatorial elections, you're, you're falling for a scam. Trump said, I'm seeing a lot of talk from people who are supposed to be on our side telling GOP voters not to go out and vote for Kelly Loeffler and David Perdue. This is nonsense. Ignore those people. We need all of our people coming out to vote for Kelly and David. Obviously, that is 100% true. So Raphael Warnock needs to lose. John Ossoff needs to lose. Perdue narrowly missed being reelected in the general election. He did beat Ossoff by a couple of points. He got 49.8% of the vote. He needed 50 in order to prevent the runoff. On Friday afternoon, Vice President Pence traveled to Georgia to campaign for Loeffler and Perdue. He called Purdue, quote, one of the greatest and staunchest allies of the MAGA agenda in the U.S. Senate and praised Leffler for building her own company from the ground and breaking barriers in business and sports. OK, the, the, the bottom line here is that Republicans cannot afford to have the Democrats running the Senate. That's insane. OK, so regardless of what you think happened in the presidential election, please do not stay home out of, in some sort of fit of peak and hand the Senate of the United States to the Democrats. That is like the dumbest thing that you can do. Now, the, the dumbest take from the media this morning uh, has come courtesy of, of friends on the never Trump left as well as the as well as the actual left. These are people who have now suggested that because Donald Trump has allowed the GSA to move forward with some of its transitional processes, they stopped the coup. So understand, these were people who were shouting from the rooftops that a coup was in progress, that America was in the midst of a constitutional crisis. It was all grinding to a halt. Two hundred and some odd years of American history. It was all coming apart. 250 years of American history it was all going to stop because Donald Trump would refuse to leave the office and we'd have a constitutional crisis and then we'd have to deploy the, the 101st Airborne to the White House in order to retake. It'll be White House down, except it'll be Trump in the role of the baddies. Okay, that was always crazy talk. It was crazy talk from beginning to end. There were those of us who are saying, okay, there's a process. It will play out. Either the evidence will be presented or it will not be presented, but we do have a legal process and Trump has a right to avail himself of all legal processes. But people on the left are saying, no, it's the end of the republic. It's a coup. It's the now, as I said all along, the reason they had to keep saying this over and over and over, despite the fact that it was pretty obvious there was a legal process and that, in fact, it is not unconstitutional, nor is it illegal for a president to avail himself of the legal process. In fact, 
It's in the legal pro like it's called the legal process, right? So that is not illegal. You file a lawsuit. That is well within the legal process. You don't have to concede. That's a formality. And that is a nicety. You could theoretically run through it. That's what Trump is doing. He's not doing anything illegal. And as I said all along, the process will play out. But the media were fully invested in the line that the entire republic was going to come to a crushing halt because President Trump was such an evil, bad man. The reason they had to say that is because they have blown all of their credibility for years on the principle that Donald Trump is an evil, nefarious fascist. Democracy dies in darkness. And so what would happen if Donald Trump lost and then left? What would happen? It would completely undermine their narrative. It would undermine the excuse they've been using for years to come out of the closet as full-scale leftists while pretending that they are still acting in objective defense of the United States from this incipient orange Hitler. And so they had to continue maintaining that myth. It was, it was necessary for them to continue maintaining the myth. So how do they maintain the myth? In, the, in face of the fact that President Trump has now authorized the GSA to begin transitional processes in lieu of final legal outcome? How do they actually maintain the myth that Trump is a Hitlerian fascist who is going to seize power, the reins of power? Uh, you'll see, it's, it's a pretty wild explanation. And it's, and it's self-flattering, of course. We'll get to that in just one moment. First, let us talk about the fact that um, there's an object that you carry around all day long. It's extremely dirty. And then you put it on your face. You get it near your nose. You get it near your mouth. You never think about it. It is your phone, of course, right? You take that phone into the bathroom with you. And then five minutes later, you have the phone close to your face, right? Your phone is filled with germs. You got your hands all over it. I know all of this is making you feel a little bit icky. Well, this is why you need phone soap. You can clean your phone with phone soap. The original patented, clinically proven UVC phone sanitizer. They've been making phone sanitizers for the last decade. Phone soap uses UVC light and their patented and clinically proven technology to kill 99.99% of germs like E. coli, salmonella, and the cold and flu virus. Phone soap can sanitize and charge your phone in as little as five minutes. It's the only consumer UV sanitizer with a 300 degree disinfectant chamber. It uses two transparent plates to suspend your phone, making sure all sides are disinfected. It looks like a little box. You put the phone in there and now it's being hit on all sides by the UVC light and killing all the germs. Phone soap makes many different models for everyone. The Phone Soap 3 sanitizes in 10 minutes. The Phone Soap Pro kills 99.99% of bacteria in five minutes. The Home Soap is big enough to sanitize tablets, toys, bottles, and more. So it's not just for your phone. It's pretty much for everything that you need to maintain a certain level of cleanliness. From today through Cyber Monday, go to phonesoap.com and use the code SANTA20 to save a whopping 20% off and receive free shipping. Phone Soap offers a lifetime warranty on their bulbs as well. From now until Cyber Monday, head on over to phonesoap.com. Remember to use the code SANTA20, save 20% and free shipping. That's phonesoap.com. Remember, use the code SANTA and the number 20 to get that special delivery at your door. And the special deal, obviously, 20% off. Okay, so what is the case? that uh, Democrats are making here. Because remember, they still have to maintain the myth. Members of the media that, that Trump is orange Hitler who is about to seize power. So this is my favorite. Jamel Bowie, who is a, uh, uh, he's an idiot. I mean, th there's no other way to put this. The, the man, it, he, he is fully committed to a peculiarly radical style of American politics in which all of his opponents are badly motivated, um, which is, on a, it's, it's both morally corrupt and idiotic in the extreme. Anyway, Jamel Bowie, he, he got angry. Because Zaid Jelani, who is a, a commentator on Twitter, pointed out what was predicted. Mass election, violence, chaos, and the end of democracy. What happened? Rage tweeting, comical lawsuits, and an otherwise fairly robust voter turnout. Okay, this happens to be basically the case, right? Yeah, everyone was saying this is the end of the republic. We're all going to die. Now, we all know what was going to happen if Trump won, right? I mean, if Trump won, there are going to be riots in the streets. There are businesses boarding up in LA, DC, New York. Okay, but then Biden appeared to win. And suddenly everybody calmed down. And so they had to come up with a new crisis to focus in on. And the crisis was the crisis of democracy. Okay, so Jamel Bowie responds to this obvious truth, which is that everybody was preemptively panicking for no reason by saying this. The earnest attempt to subvert and overturn the election didn't pan out. So the people who urged vigilance were being hysterical is, the, is probably going to be conventional wisdom for the professional contrarian set. Well, um, hold up. Um, well, no, you, you, you were being hysterical. So instead, I guess the argument is that According to Jamel Bowie, the coup was going to happen, except that Jamel Bowie tweeted about it and then it didn't happen, which is really exciting news, is that people on Twitter tweeting about things, it makes change happen. It's very flattering to the, to the commentary set to believe that if you tweet loudly enough about things, they magically occur. So the coup was about to happen, but then Joe, Jamel Bowie tweeted and wrote in the New York Times about how the coup was about to happen, and then Trump uncooed. Or alternatively, you guys are radical morons. Hey, David Frum, another radical moron, and not radical in politics, just radical in his stupidity at this point. He tweeted out, perhaps some excited person did overreact to something. That happens. But if you're one of those belittling what the country just went through, the people who worried, they saved your country without you. Nope. Nope. 
Okay, the people who worried did not save the country. The people who worried just made things worse on Twitter, which is what they do all day. David Frum didn't save the country by sitting there and fretting. This basic notion in politics that if you worry really deeply about a thing that you are helping is really stupid. It's not true. It's not true in any walk of life. Worry rarely solves problems. You know, action solves problems. But it wasn't even though, as though popular action solved a problem. There was no elected official anywhere here who was pressured by the constituents into doing something different. You know what was always going to happen? The legal process. You know what happened? The legal process. Federal judges struck down lawsuits that they didn't think had an evidentiary basis. You saw Republicans saying that votes were going to be certified and the votes were certified. So it wasn't David Frum and his cadre of malcontents sitting there and rage tweeting through the night about how this was a, an assault on democracy and it was the end of everything and this was going to be like Pinochet taking power. Okay, all of that was crap. And you guys got humiliated because it was crap. And now you're insisting that the only reason it didn't happen is because you were rage tweeting about it. I'm sorry, you're ridiculous. You're ridiculous. Like, you know, who points this out is Ben Dreyfus, the editorial director of Mother Jones. He gets this right. He tweeted out, the idea that people who predicted the very worst outcomes are actually just vigilant is insane. In the days before the election, I had multiple people tell me Biden would win, but that it would be stolen and that our militias would kill, kill thousands of people in the streets. He's at no point since November 4th has it ever been in doubt that Biden would be inaugurated on January 28th. Literally for months before the election, media made it seem that actual, revolu actual revolutions and bleep were possible. He says that there's a radio lab from right before the election, which you can dig up yourself, where they say it might come down to who the military thinks should get the nuclear codes. Like, what the F game of pretend is this? People believe this bleep because media places say it. He says, one man's paranoid catastrophizer is another man's just being vigilant. This is exactly right. Okay, if Ben Dreyfus from Mother Jones can see it, why can't folks on the mainstream left see it? Because folks on the mainstream left or anti-Trump forces on the right had a picture of Trump. That picture has been cracked at every available opportunity by the actual action of Trump. Not by the stuff he says. Trump always says ridiculous stuff, but the stuff he actually does. Trump was never at any point going to seize power in a coup, requiring the military to kick him out. That was always something that the left wanted to see because it would have fulfilled their picture of who Trump was and who Trump's supporters are by extension. Because see, you see for the left, they, they have not been doing particularly well in these elections. Joe Biden won. He only won because the media spent four years basically consigning Trump to the bowels of hell while ignoring Joe Biden's actual record on every available issue and the media lying about every available narrative and Trump shooting himself in the foot a lot. Okay, but in Congress, they didn't do well. In the Senate, they didn't do well. And so they have to come up with an excuse. And the excuse for Democrats is always the same. The American people are dullards. They are dullards. They're dullards or they are racists or they are bigots. And that's why they follow President Trump. Right? That is always the narrative. That's the narrative from the media. Even today, right? they continue to push forward this narrative. Right? There's Sonny Hostin on The View suggesting that Republicans voted for Trump knowing he was racist. This all ties together. If you paint Trump as the world's deepest threat, that means that you also get to paint his voters as the world's deepest threat. And you get to paint half the country as terrible, terrible people, which of course makes leftists feel better about not being able to win over those people. And you hear Sonny Hostin saying this. I think Trumpism is here to stay, quite frankly. Like you said, um, will be enjoyed. 70, over 70 million people voted for him uh, in spite of the fact that they knew that he was racist and misogynist, uh, transphobic, homophobic. Um, and, and, and so they voted for him anyway. Um, and it just, it just seems to me that that uh, people's hearts and minds don't change that quickly. And if we stop talking about uh, President Trump, then, you know, I, I'm always fearful that past becomes prologue, right? Ah, if we, so they're just going to continue talking about President Trump because, of course, it allows them a prism to castigate all of Trump supporters as ignorant bigots. And that's really the end goal here, isn't it? The longer you can portray Trump as a dictator, even though he started the process of transition with the GSA without having conceded the election even, the longer you can continue to portray everybody who disagrees with you as a morally benighted fool. Really solid stuff here from the media and from the left. We'll get to more of that in just one second because this is sort of media conventional wisdom. First, let us talk about your safety and your security and keeping an eye on your property. So for me, I got three kids under the age of seven. And they're kids. That means that I really need to keep an eye on them because sometimes they do things that are not particularly smart and I want to be able to run in and stop them from doing it. But there's only one of me and there are three of them. They are, as I like to call them, the army of the children. And this is why I love my ring devices. I can keep an eye on them anywhere, anytime. I can keep an eye on them simultaneously. It's fantastic. With Ring, you can keep an eye on all the hustle and bustle in your house, at your front door, no matter where you are, right from your phone. If somebody stops by or something is going on, Ring lets you know you can see and speak to whoever is there from anywhere. This holiday season, it's not just the best time to have Ring. It is the best time to give it as well. Ring makes a great holiday gift. This holiday season, give someone the gift 
of peace of mind. Ring has security products for every corner of your home inside and out. Best of all, you can see it all in the Ring app. Ring has everything you need to keep an eye on home this holiday season and throughout the year. Help protect your whole home with Ring Alarm. It's a powerful, affordable whole home security system you can easily install yourself. Now, as a public figure, I'm deeply concerned about my own safety, which is why as soon as we moved, my wife insisted we put up the Ring devices. You should too. For a limited time, go to ring.com slash Ben. Receive special Black Friday and Cyber Monday offers. That is ring.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Ring.com slash Ben. Okay, so the entire media has jumped into this narrative that even though Trump has started the sort of transitional process, and this means that uh, he was going to be a dictator and he should never work with Republicans because Republicans are bad. Don Lemon on CNN, a very objective journalist, starts journalisming everywhere. The journalism was getting pretty much all over the place here. Here he was with Block of Wood, Chris Cuomo, explaining there should never be any unity with Republicans because Republicans are bad because they were going to be uh, complicit in a coup that never happened and was never going to happen. How do you come to some sort of compromise or an agreement with a person who doesn't believe in science, a person who doesn't believe in facts, a person who doesn't believe in reality. How do you come to some sort of agreement that you don't care enough about maybe yourself or you don't care enough about someone else that you just can't put a little piece of cloth over your face? I don't know where the compromise and the come togethering, I know that's not earth, where that's going to come from. You can't compromise with these people. You can't come together with them. They support coups. They won't put on a mask. You got to get it again. The idea here from the media is that everybody who disagrees with them is morally bad, is morally bankrupt. And the way you can tell this is because Trump is morally bad and morally bankrupt. As Trump said, and it was the truest thing that he said in all of his years in politics, they don't hate him. They don't hate you because they hate Trump. If you support Trump, they don't hate you because they hate Trump. They hate Trump because they hate you. He's just a stand in for their hatred of you because you think differently. And meanwhile, Joe Biden has started selecting his cabinet. And it's amazing to watch how the media in real time switch from Donald Trump is awful and he's a swamp creature and he's corrupt and he's compromised to, you know, it'd be great again, like the old Washington parties with the schmoozing and everything. Because basically Joe Biden is just the swamp. And we've known this for a very long time. He's a conventional politician going back 50 years. He is a swamp thing. He occupies the swamp. And the media are celebrating this stuff because the media went from democracy dies in darkness to, you know what? If we don't watch so closely anymore, that's okay. Because, you know, this is just the establishment doing what the establishment does. The Washington Post originally had a headline titled Washington's Aristocracy hopes a Biden presidency will make schmoozing great again. They changed that to Washington's establishment because they realized uh, that it sounded kind of bad. This is from the Washington Post lifestyle section. Roxanne Roberts writes, Washington is exhausted. Washington is optimistic. Washington is desperate for change. The aristocracy of the city is ready to move on, daring to hope that the last four years was a fever that finally broke and life can get back to normal. Now, a lot of us are thinking to ourselves, back to normal means the same cast of liars who occupied high positions of power and in flowered and honeyed language spoke soft promises into our ears that were never fulfilled, sold out the interests of the United States to powers adverse to the interests of the United States and got rich in the process, right? That's what Washington, D.C. was before Trump got there. Trump didn't fix all of those problems, but he did blow up a lot of the conventional wisdom that dominated, particularly in the foreign policy circles of Washington, D.C. And that was quite good because it ended with China feeling more confronted than ever. It ended with Iran feeling boxed in. Well, now the Washington, D.C. establishment is happy because they're back on top. And guess what? The media is part of that Washington, D.C. establishment. Your legacy media are part of the system. They are not sitting apart from the system and keeping an eye on the system. They are not keeping an eagle eye on action. You, you want to know how non-objective the media all are. All you have to do is not just look at their treatment of the Trump administration in a vacuum, right? Because that's what an adversarial media looks like. It's the fact that they stop being adversarial, the media, the, the, the minute their friends are in power. So you get this from the Washington Post. Normal. They're looking back to life getting back to normal, the aristocracy of the city. Normal, as in a respect for experience and expertise. Normal, as in civility and bipartisan cooperation. Normal, as in not wanting to punch someone in the face. At the center of this hope is President-elect Biden, moderate by nature, attuned to the rhythms of the town, eager to bring people back together. Spare me, okay? I'm just gonna vomit until there's no more places to vomit in the studio. It's gonna be like The Exorcist. Okay, let, let me explain. Experience and expertise, as we'll explore, with the, with the Biden cabinet and the supposed Biden administration. Experience and expertise means a bunch of Washington, D.C. insiders who have been wrong on every major issue of the last three decades. Civility and bipartisan cooperation means castigating all of your opponents as racist, up to and including Mitt Romney. Right? Their new best friend, Mitt Romney, Joe Biden was saying that he wanted to re-enslave black people just eight years ago. As, for, as far as not wanting to punch somebody in the face, you may have noticed that the people who are largely doing the punching in the face are the people who say it's time to punch Nazis and then declare that all Trump supporters are Nazis. 
But it's back to normal, guys. And the media have decided that it's time to stop. It's time to stop worrying and be happy and love the swamp. According to the Washington Post, at the heart of this optimism is the belief that politicians on both sides of the aisle get more accomplished when they like each other. And the other business of Washington, the cultural institutions, the diplomatic corps, the gala fundraisers, the hundreds of historical traditions need bipartisanship to really thrive. They struggled during the Trump administration when everything became a test of loyalty and the notion that good people could disagree without being disagreeable was laughable. Again, Donald Trump did not create those conditions in Washington, D.C. Donald Trump was the coroner of American politics. He was not the murderer. Bipartisanship died during the Obama era. George W. Bush pursued No Child Left Behind. He pursued Medicare Part D. George W. Bush actually did pursue bipartisan cooperation. And then the Democrats spat in his face from 2006 on and suggested that he was evil, nefarious Bush Hitler who wanted to destroy the economy and murder Iraqis. Okay, and then Obama came in and proceeded to never do a single piece of serious bipartisan legislation. Not one. You cannot name a serious piece of bipartisan legislation that Barack Obama did. The only thing you can name that he did with Republicans was sequestration, which ended with the gutting of the American military. That is the only major thing that, Trump, that, that Obama ever did. And he spent his entire career castigating the other side as covert racist. If you read his stupid autobiography, his latest one million page tome about how wonderful he is and how disappointed he is in you and the rest of America. The entire book is about how everybody who opposed him is either stupid or racist or both, right? The Tea Party was just a bunch of racists. And yet we're being told by Washington, we're going to go back to that normal. That normal was a time when you all got along, don't you know? That normal was a time when bipartisanship thrived. If you can explain to me how bipartisanship thrived when Barack Obama literally declared he couldn't get anything done, so he was going to use a pen and a phone to overwrite his constitutional powers, then more power to you because it doesn't make any sense. It is just you being lied to. It's just being, it's you being lied to. They say that they're going to bring back the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Ooh, 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 happy clapping. The White House Correspondents' Dinner is going to come back. Yay. Typically, a night of mutual goodwill between the administration and the press that covers it became an awkward defense of the First Amendment, sometimes tense when comedian Michelle Wolf eviscerated Sarah Sanders. Well, I mean, actually, she called her ugly. Sometimes lackluster when Ron Chernow was recruited to speak the following year. Oh, you mean the White House Correspondents' Dinner that spent its time making jokes about how wonderful Obama was and how terrible Bush was? Oh, yeah, that. Back to normal, it means more state dinners, a prestigious, glamorous way of reestablishing global ties. Oh, you mean the aristocrats are back and they get to have black tie dinners with foreign dignitaries while people in the United States can't go back to work because Democrats are locking down their cities. Good times, really exciting. It also means that Washington events traditionally attended by the president and first lady, the honors, the alfalfa dinner, the gridiron, Ford Theater's gala, the correspondence dinner will likely return to their former glory. Oh, how nice. Aren't you excited? We're going back to normal, guys. And normal's going to be so awesome because it sucked so much the first time that we elected Trump. This is how you got Trump. And the media's takeaway from this is, let's just go right back to it. It was great. The Obama era was wonderful. We'll get to more of this because this is how Biden is staffing his cabinet as well. If you thought that the old normal was great, then I'm sure you will enjoy a Joe Biden administration. If you thought the old normal sucked, get ready for more of it because here it comes down the pike, the fully corrupt, fully establishment bad conventional wisdom, hang out with all of your bipartisan cronies in pursuing bigger government and violating the rights of individual Americans. That's exciting stuff because the really important thing is that we have the veneer of nicety atop the roiling, the roiling chaos of American politics. Not that we be honest about our actual divisions in the country. We can never be honest about our actual divisions. Instead, we'll go back to a time when the president of the United States subtly suggested that everybody who opposed his big government agenda was a sick, a sick bastard. And, but that'll be good because, I mean, then it'll be, you know, back to nicety. I mean, then you'll have like Joe Biden who speaks with like a, a bit more flowery tone. than Don At least you won't have the tweets. I mean, at least you won't have the tweets. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let's talk about your sleep quality. If all of this makes you want to lose sleep, you still need your sleep. And that's why you need a mattress that is personalized for you. I have one. It's Helix Sleep. I don't just have one because I'm special. I have one because Helix Sleep will do this for everyone, right? They have a quiz. It takes just two minutes to complete. They match your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. Why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? With Helix, you're getting a mattress you know will be perfect for the way you sleep. Everybody is unique. Helix knows that. So they have several different mattress models to, to help you choose. They have soft, medium, firm mattresses. Mattress is great for cooling you down if you sleep hot. Even a Helix sleep mattress for plus size folks. I took the Helix, the Helix sleep quiz. And I got a firm mattress that really breathes really well because I tend to heat up a lot when I sleep. And it is absolutely comfortable. It is awesome checking out Helix Sleep. Go check them out right now. There are a lot of folks who have been sending us unboxing videos. You also found the Helix Sleep mattress of your dreams. If you are looking for a mattress, take the quiz, order the mattress. You don't even need to go to a mattress store. Again, it gets shipped directly to your door for free. 
Right now, they've got a 10-year warranty. You get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free, so you really have nothing to lose. Head on over to helixsleep.com slash Ben. Take their two-minute sleep quiz. They will match you to that customized mattress. Again, that's helixsleep.com slash Ben. Go check them out right now. Hey, so it's not just that we are going to reestablish all of the wonderful swampy traditions that existed before. Biden's cabinet is going to be full of swampy people. CNN is particularly pumped about this. So it's hilarious. Donald Trump appointed a gay ambassador to, to Germany, Richard Grinnell. He appointed a black secretary of housing and urban development in Ben Carson. Uh, Donald Trump had, had a wide variety of, of people, including the first uh, successful female campaign manager in Kellyanne Conway. None of that was historic, right? It's only historic when a Democrat does things. So Biden's cabinet, his cabinet picks are all D.C. establishment insiders who are mostly white. They're mostly white men. CNN declares this is very historic. It's just, like John Kerry's coming back. That's historic. I mean, historic in the sense that John Kerry never left and he has always been around and Captain Easter Island head over here. He's, he's coming back. So are you excited about that? CNN says it's so historic, so much history making in the cab. Uh, it's so tiresome. It's so tiresome to go from Donald Trump is the font of all evil to all the people who sucked at politics for decades on end. I mean, John Kerry has not just been wrong on every major political decision of his entire career. He also happens to be going all the way back to his lying testimony during the Vietnam War, a very not good person. John Kerry is a historic figure, according to CNN. If you trust CNN, honestly, I have a bridge in Brooklyn to sell you. And if you don't trust CNN, cut your damn cable and get Daily Wire or go get The Blaze or go get, or go get a subscription to some other news service because, I mean, these people are just awful. A historic first at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, President-elect Biden is saying he will indeed nominate uh, Alejandro Mayorkas. He will be the first immigrant and Latino, if confirmed, to serve as the, the head of DHS, as well as the director of national intelligence. Another historic uh, pick there, Avril Haines. Biden has whittled down the list to former Fed Chair Janet Yellen or current Federal Reserve Governor Lael Brainard. Now, both of these women would make a historic appointment, the first woman Treasury Secretary. Okay, so um, just, just going to point out here that um, there have been Hispanic people who have served in high positions in the Trump administration. And, and by the way, J painting Janet Yellen as historic is absurd. I mean, Janet Yellen headed the Federal Reserve for years and years and years. Okay, is she significantly more powerful if we appoint her the head of the Treasury Department? Like, this is, it's all ridiculous. It's all the media trying to spin Biden's victory into something transformational when really it's just a return to the bad old days. That's all it is. And let's face it, the bad old days, they weren't that great. We're being told the great old days of Obama. It was an era of bipartisanship and warmth. No, it was an era of bipartisanship. If by bipartisanship, you mean the media got along famously with the folks in the White House who were simultaneously threatening them. If that's what you mean by bipartisanship, then yay, good for you guys. You can be all happy again. It's your happy time. I mean, you won't have Donald Trump to beat up on, so your ratings are going to decline markedly. But still, you'll have your happy day. Your happy day where you can just go and hang out with Joe Biden and ask him softball questions, and he can mumble his way through an answer that doesn't make any sense and start talking about corn pop. And then you can have yourself a great, great time. So who exactly is on Biden's team? Who is this transformational team? This historic, historic team? Well, according to Politico, it's a team of careerists. Oh, yeah, you mean all the old people, uh, all the people who they had like five minutes ago. The most prominent appointment president-elect Joe Biden, according to Politico, has made for his new White House team is Chief of Staff Ron Klain, a longtime Biden advisor who went to Harvard Law School and won a prestigious Supreme Court clerkship. The most prominent appointment he has made so far to his cabinet is Secretary of State Designate Antony Blinken, a longtime Biden advisor who went to Harvard as an undergrad and then moved through the Washington foreign policy establishment. How about Jake Sullivan? the choice to lead the National Security Council, a previous Biden advisor who went to Yale. And then there's Bruce Reed, who's been talked about. He's a veteran Biden aide. His choice for Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen is not a longtime Biden advisor, but she served as head of the Federal Reserve throughout the entirety of the Obama administration. So basically, he's bringing back all of these people and people are, oh, wow, it's transformational, isn't it? Because your media lied to you. They are damned liars. And all they do all day long is talk about how everything is swampy when Trump is running the place. But then the actual swamp rushes back in with all the attendant muck. And they're like, oh, it's transformational. And it's also a return to normalcy. Amazing. Amazing. OK, so let's go through some of the people that that Biden has now selected for his cabinet. So some of the people that Biden has selected for his cabinet, it is basically the same old faces who blew it the first time around, who sucked at their jobs the first time around. OK, Antony Blinken, he's better than Susan Rice because a bag of flaming hot dog crap is better than Susan Rice would be as Secretary of State. I mean, Susan Rice lied repeatedly to the American people about Benghazi. She happened to be radically anti-Israel. She's been wrong on every major foreign policy issue, and she has scorn for half the American population. 
Anthony Blinken isn't that, but that's kind of what you can say about Anthony Blinken. I mean, that's kind of like the whole thing. So Anthony Blinken has been wrong about a wide variety of issues. He was wrong on Iran, for example. This is all the conventional wisdom just returning. Right? It's all just the conventional, like, he's a very articulate guy, Anthony Blinken. He served again in the, uh, he, he served again in the Obama administration and with Joe Biden in the Senate. And everything that he has said is conventional wisdom nonsense. It's just not true. See, the thing about the Trump administration is the one area where they were actually the best is in foreign policy. They didn't start any new wars. They boxed Iran in. They helped form actual Mid Middle Eastern peace deals. They helped, they, they helped box China in. Right? They, they, they did a bunch of things on foreign policy that were actually quite good. But the conventional foreign, foreign policy wisdom is going to rush back in because no need to actually examine the new evidence. They had to be right all along. And we know they're all right all along because they are the conventional wisdom. I mean, they wouldn't be called the conventional wisdom if they weren't wise, right? I mean, Anthony Blinken in 2012 spoke at the J Street Conference. J Street is a radically anti-Israel group posing as a pro-Israel group simply so that Democrats can pretend they are pro-Israel by speaking to J Street, which again has opposed every element of Israeli security since its inception. It was specifically created as a counter to AIPAC because the Democrats thought that AIPAC was too pro-Israel, so they had to create this bullcrap group of people who really don't like Israel very much. So Blinken spoke to them, and he suggested that Israelis and Palestinians could only make peace if they actually started making peace agreements between themselves. The Arabs would never make peace without the, without the Israelis making peace with the Palestinians. That, of course, was absolutely false. It was also conventional wisdom. It was absolutely false. Blinken in 2017 was still maintaining the Iran deal was absolutely fantastic, even though Iran has spent the better part of all of its time since the Iran deal fostering terrorism. And it was only the renewed sanctions against Iran that undercut its economy and helped create the impetus for an alliance in the Middle East between Arab states and Israel, including Saudi Arabia. Benjamin Netanyahu went and visited Saudi Arabia yesterday. Here's Anthony Blinken being absolutely wrong about the Iran deal. If you ask the Israeli military or intelligence community today mm -hmm. whether we should pull out of the deal, you will get a resounding no. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, uh, many of them have acknowledged to us, some will actually say this publicly, others won't, that it has removed uh, a significant concern for them, at least far into the future. And everything we've seen and our intelligence community has seen and has said publicly is that the overwhelming bulk of the proceeds that they've managed to get back have gone into the economy not, not to Hezbollah. Okay, I mean, this not is insane, Hezbollah. okay? He's just saying absolute crap, and this guy's gonna be Secretary of State. The Israelis hated the Iran deal. They hated it. Benjamin Netanyahu came to the United States to lobby against the Iran deal, and Obama showed him the back door of the White House. So that guy, who's complicit in that entire process, he's like, oh, I'm back, and I'm here with my conventional wisdom that was completely debunked by subsequent events, but don't worry, I haven't changed my opinions at all. By the way, I love how he's like, well, you know, most of that money went back to the economy, not to terrorism. Most of the money? How about the billions that did not go back into the economy, but instead were used to foster regional terrorism. Apparently that doesn't matter. Okay, he's not the only one in the, in the new Biden cabinet who is, who is pushing failed conventional wisdom, particularly on Iran. We'll get to more of this in just one second. First, let us talk about some bad news. So business owners, I have some bad news for you. If you are not using text messages, you are really, really missing out. And many of you are not using text messages. You're trying to call people and they're not calling you back. You're sending them an email. It's going directly to their spam folder. You need to be using texts. Okay, you text your friends, but if you are a business and you are not using text, you are missing out. You can save time and money. You're not going to spend as much effort calling customers about their order or their appointment. Texts get open 97% of the time. Your customers will get their message. You can text back and forth, giving you freedom from being tethered to your phone. How can you make your business text friendly? You can check out Podium. Podium works fantastically, fantastically well. Podium helps you transition over to a text-based business. And right now, I'm teaming up with Podium for a special offer. For a limited time, you can sign up with Podium for 20% off your plan. They're so confident that if Podium doesn't make your business better within 90 days, they'll send you a $150 Amazon gift card for the holidays. Go to podium.com slash Shapiro to get started. That is 20% off. If you go to podium.com slash Shapiro, go to podium.com slash Shapiro today to get started. We're talking about car dealers who've been selling cars only through text and dentists booking appointments before the end of the year using just text. You can be doing it, that kind of stuff. Make your business more efficient. Check them out, podium.com slash Shapiro. And you get 20% off if you use that special code, podium.com slash Shapiro. Okay, we'll get back to the reestablishment of the establishment celebrated by the media, right? Your media, democracy dies in darkness media. First, Thanksgiving is almost here. That means Black Friday is almost here as well. Since last year's Black Friday deal, we've been consistently adding more features and products to our membership program. We are super excited about what is yet to come. There's a lot yet to come. To name a few things, we've added more exclusive Reader's Pass content. Our insider and above members can now stream our content on Apple TV and Roku. We are currently adding the entire PragerU catalog behind our paywall. 
Your account now comes with custom badges that you can earn by participating in current events as well. If you're an All Access member, you get to join All Access Live. That's our exclusive daily live streams with me or one of the other hosts where we talk directly with you about, well, pretty much anything. Gave a lot of parental advice last night on All Access Live, some spousal advice. Also, I sang bizarre songs and did weird impressions. You also get two Leftist Tears tumblers, early access to our Daily Wire merch, and daily discussions with our writers and special guests as well. We're also continuing to add new features and products, like the entire PragerU library that is currently being added to the website, and content from Candace Owens, who's joining us next year with a brand new show. Needless to say, we are pretty excited about this year's deal. You will not want to miss it. You're listening to the largest, fastest-growing conservative podcast and radio show in the nation. Okay, so the establishment is back in with its conventional wisdom, like Iran is great and the Iran deal is great and the Israelis will never be able to make peace with the Arab states without the Palestinians being involved. All of it was wrong. All of it was wrong. You also had Tony Blinken circa 2017 talking at Goldman Sachs, which shows you how uh, establishment insidery the entire Biden team is, saying we should have done more militarily in Syria. Yeah, that would have been a great idea is to dump more American troops into Syria. Those of us involved in the diplomacy at various points thought that it might make a difference if uh, we showed a little bit of muscle as a way of leveraging the diplomacy. Mm -hmm. And there are various things that we thought about that I couldn't tell you today whether they in fact would have made a difference. But at the time we thought they would be worth trying. The military was very concerned, understandably, about getting into a slippery slope. Okay, just a, a quick point here. Donald Trump was decried by the left as a warmonger. He didn't start a new war. Because Tony Blinken says things like leverage, and we're gonna leverage diplomacy using other assets, which is code for we're going to bomb places and kill people. And we're supposed to believe that he's actually like a nice guy because Democrats are nice people while they're droning people and bombing places and launching unconstitutional wars in Libya. And so that's exciting. We've got that whole team coming up. By the way, Obama has already said that he's very excited about this new team. You know who's back also is John Kerry. John Kerry. I mean, I'm excited because I get to do my John Kerry impersonation again. So that's good. I thought that that sucker was going to die in 2004. And that's been around a subsequent 16 years. So John Kerry is back. He's back and he's worse than ever. He's going to be the new climate czar. Which is exciting. It means he gets to stay at, uh, as John, Tom Cotton says, he gets to stay at wonderful luxury hotels while negotiating deals that are bad for America. That, that's accurate. John Kerry was the architect of the crappy Iran deal. He then proceeded to become a PR flack for the nation of Iran and more importantly for the mullahs that rule Iran, suggesting that their pursuit of terrorism in the region was really no big deal. John Kerry, wrong about every major issue of his entire lifetime. Here was John Kerry suggesting just a few years ago that peace in the Middle East would literally be impossible if Israel did not make concessions to the Palestinians. Here he was being as wrong as a human being can be. But don't worry, the good news is that if you are a member of the government, you always just keep failing up. If you suck at something, you will end up as president one day because you will just keep failing up. Joe Biden is proof of this. Here is, here is John Kerry, who nearly became president. Narrowly, we, we narrowly avoided that. Here he was being totally wrong about everything. Good news, he's got a new slot where he gets to talk about climate change, presumably making the American economy worse to no apparent effect. There will be no separate peace between Israel and the Arab world. I want to make that very clear to all of you. I've heard several prominent politicians in Israel sometimes saying, well, the Arab world's in a different place now. We just have to reach out to them and we can work some things with the Arab world and we'll deal with the Palestinians. No, 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 and no. There will be no advance and separate peace with the Arab world without the Palestinian process and Palestinian peace. Everybody needs to understand that. Everybody needs to understand that. Everybody needs to, and I know what I'm talking about because I'm wearing my glasses very far down on my nose, which means I know what I'm saying. That guy is a moron. He is the stupidest person in American foreign policy, and he's going to be in charge of America's climate change policy, which already is rife with stupidity and a complete disconnect between actual meaningful action on climate change and what Democrats are talking about. Paris agreements don't do a, a, they don't do a bleep's worth. Okay, they are not worth anything. The Paris agreements are worthless. They are counterproductive. I've talked at length about actual things you could do in order to fight climate change. They could do adaptation. You could be building infrastructure. You could be investing in technologies that help suck the carbon out. Of the, it's all sorts of stuff you can do, but you put that moron in charge. That's good news. Also, President Biden is bringing President-elect Biden, as they are now designating him. He is not formally president-elect yet. He plans to nominate Janet Yellen, former Federal Reserve chairwoman. She's transformational too, except for the fact that she was the Federal Reserve chairwoman for years and years and years and years. Her basic philosophy is that you keep pumping money into the economy until you get unemployment down. She's also not super warm on capitalism. 
Here is what she said recently. There really is a new kind of recognition. You've got a society where capitalism is beginning to run amok and needs to be readjusted in order to make sure that what we're doing is sustainable and the benefits of growth are widely shared in ways they haven't been. Oh, goody. So we can use monetary policy in order to achieve political goals Democrats couldn't otherwise achieve. Okay, and it doesn't. the cabinet doesn't stop there. Are you guys ready for more? Excellent stuff. Alejandro Mayorka, a former deputy Homeland Security secretary, is now going to lead the Homeland Security Department. Now, that's not really a particularly big deal. He would take the lead on enforcing immigration and border law, also providing a coordinated response to terrorism, maritime aviation, and cybersecurity threats. He's supposed to be a stabilizing force inside the Biden administration. There's only one problem, which is that he has faced barriers in a path to confirmation before. After he was nominated to serve as Deputy Homeland Security Secretary, the department's inspector general investigated him for intervening to help expedite visa reviews for foreign investors while leading the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. He was found not to have broken the law, but the inspector general released a report in 2015 that found he managed cases for EB-5 visas in a way that led employees to believe he was giving special consideration to investors aligned with Democrats. Ah, the swamp is back and better than ever. How exciting. Woo! Okay, so... The establishment is back. That is the bottom line here. And uh, it's ugly. It's ugly. I mean, Jake Sullivan is back. And right? Jake Sullivan, again, a, uh, a former deputy NSA guy under Barack Obama, and he was a Hillary Clinton acolyte. He helped run her campaign. And here he was suggesting that Trump created the Iranian crisis and uh, that, that Iran was so much better before, before Donald Trump got involved, which neglects the fact that Iran was killing American soldiers in the field while Barack Obama was president of the United States. Here's Jake Sullivan sucking at his job, but don't worry, he's back too. We are in the midst of a crisis with Iran today because Donald Trump decided to tear up the Iran nuclear deal, to walk away from the agreement. Now, he went out and said, it's because of the deal that we're in this crisis, when in fact, it's exactly the opposite. Donald Trump has spent the last three years trashing our NATO allies, telling the rest of the world that they can basically go take a hike. And now those very same allies and partners are putting out statements where they're calling on both Iran and the United States to de-escalate, where they're saying a pox on both your houses, where they're basically putting Iran and the United States on the same plane. Okay, so are you, dude. Okay, again, th this is the, the new Biden cabinet, same as the old Biden cabinet. I hope that you've enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed that four-year interregnum between the continuing rule of the American aristocracy of wrongness, between new Secretary of State Tony Blinken, who again has been wrong on every major issue, push the Iran deal, push softness on China, between John Kerry, who is back and worse than ever. He's going to be heading up the climate change nonsense. You got Janet Yellen for Treasury Secretary, who uh, has been suggesting that the Federal Reserve should be buying long-term bonds and mortgage-backed securities to prop up the market and has suggested her antipathy to certain elements of what she calls kind of doggy dog capitalism. You got Alejandro Mayorkas for Department of Homeland Security, who of course was investigated for the possibility of engaging in EB-5 immigration form fraud in order to benefit Democratic donors. It turned out that he did not violate the law according to the investigation, but he did provide the appearance of violating the law. You got Jake Sullivan for NSA, former Hillary Clinton guy. And that's exciting. And just to spice things up, just to spice things up a little bit, Joe Biden is also adding a person named Rima Dodin, as well as Shuan Zagoff. They were each named Deputy Director of the Office of Legislative Affairs. Dodin currently serves as Deputy Chief of Staff and Floor Director for Senator Dick Durbin, the Assistant Minority Leader. So she's historic because she was born to Arab-Israeli immigrants in North Carolina. She's also historic because she is uh, incredibly radical. It turns out that in 2002, she justified suicide bombings as, quote, the last resort of a desperate people, talking about Palestinian suicide bombings. This is according to Israel 365 News. One year earlier, she took part in a demonstration at UC Berkeley, calling for the university to divest from Israel, according to the Berkeley Daily Planet. At that demonstration, protesters compared Israel to apartheid South Africa. She's in regular contact with the Radical Council on American-Islamic Relations. So that is uh, exciting stuff. Really, really good stuff. Meanwhile, by the way, the radicals in the Democratic Party are displeased because there are so many establishment members of the Democratic Party. So the battle has just begun over there. The radicals in the Democratic Party are very upset because they wanted more radicals. So Rashida Tlaib, who ain't a friend of the Jews, you may have noticed, she tweeted out that she was deeply, deeply unhappy. Why? Because Tony Blinken might be too pro-Israel, which is absurd, okay? Tony Blinken is not an extremely pro-Israel guy. He is like mainstream Democratic Party, which means ambivalent about Israel at this point. That did not stop Rashida Tlaib from tweeting, so long as he doesn't suppress my First Amendment right to speak out against Netanyahu's racist and inhumane policies, the Palestinian people deserve equality and justice. 
I wonder why she would tweet that about Tony Blinken. I, I can't I can't imagine why why she would tweet that about Tony Blinken. By the way, Susan Rice endorsed Tony Blinken. So it, it the the team is back together, gang. So if you enjoyed the team, get ready for more of the team. And we're going to go back to the way that politics used to run in Washington, D.C., which is super exciting as well. It's not just that the old team is back. It's that we're going to get the same sort of corporatism that dominated Washington, D.C. for a while there. So one of the great lies about America's corporations that America's corporations are free market loving entities. That is not right. Corporations are profit seeking. That is not the same thing as free market loving. There are many corporations that will take government subsidies. There are many corporations that, in fact, seek regulatory control. They engage in what's called regulatory capture, where they help write the rules along with their buddies inside the government. Well, now GM is demonstrating that it is ready to play ball with the Biden administration. GM, according to Reuters, said on Monday it was reversing course and will no longer back the Trump administration's efforts to bar California from setting its own emissions rules in an ongoing court fight. GM chief executive Mary Barra said in a letter to environmental groups it was, quote, immediately withdrawing from the preemptive the, the preemption litigation and inviting other lawmaker automakers to join us. Why, it's almost as though they are attempting to get a pat on the head from Joe Biden and company. Yes, corporations seeking special benefits from the federal government. If you enjoyed that when Obama was president, then you get it again. Woo, so much fun. The dramatic rejection of Trump came as GM sought to work with President-elect Joe Biden, who has made boosting electric vehicles a top priority. The Detroit automaker has laid out an ambitious strategy to boost EV sales. Last week said it will increase spending on EVs and autonomous vehicles by 35% from previous disclosed plans. The announcement reflects corporate America's move to engage quickly with the incoming Democratic administration. In October 2019, GM had joined Toyota, Fiat, and other automakers in backing the Trump administration because California was trying to set its own statewide fuel efficiency rules and zero emissions requirements. The Trump administration said, hold up, federal preemption applies here. We have federal laws that set the emission standards. You can't make your own emission standards above and beyond that. The automakers are like, yeah, that makes sense. Presumably, they wanted to compete in a freer, less regulated market. Now, they see the possibility of regulation coming down the pike, and they're like, we'll work with you guys. We'll work with you guys. So it's going to be fun to watch the swamp reconstituted. That is, that is excellent stuff. Really, really excellent. Okay. Meanwhile, COVID continues to wash across the land, and the hypocrisy of Democrats continues to be demonstrated full scale. So first of all, let me just point out here that uh, the media are garbage once more. So when it comes to COVID, the media are just absolute horse crap garbage. Let me give you an example. So CNN has a piece today titled, the number of COVID-19 cases reported each week in Florida has tripled since the state reopened. According to CNN, since Governor Ron DeSantis reopened Florida in late September, the number of reported COVID-19 cases per week in the state has tripled. On September 25th, DeSantis signed an executive order reopening the state, freeing restaurants and bars to operate at 100% capacity. In the week leading up to the order, Florida reported more than 17,000 new cases. In the past seven days, the state has reported more than 53,000, meaning three times more Floridians have tested positive in the past week than in the week before the reopening. See, Florida's really, really bad, according to the geniuses over at CNN. I mean, truly horrific, according to the geniuses over at CNN. There is only one problem with this particular take. If you look at how other states in the United States are doing, and they didn't do the reopening orders, you know what they're seeing, guys. You know what they're seeing? They are seeing a surge. You would have known that. No, that's a shocker. I can't believe it. In fact, let me read you the, the number of total cases per 1 million population. Total cases per 1 million population uh, at, at current. Florida does not rank. It, it's just it, in terms of per 100,000 population, how many new cases they have. Not particularly high. They're not that because they have a very, very large population. Also, New York, totally shut down, right? New York has seen a massive increase in the number of diagnosed cases week on week. I'll just take a random day. October 8th, they had about 2,000 diagnosed cases in New York. Yesterday, they had 6,000 diagnosed cases in New York. Wait, three times as many cases in a single day as they had just a month and a half ago. Why, it's almost as though COVID is hitting everybody and CNN is absolutely and completely full of crap. No, I can't believe it. Who would, who, no, no, that can't be the case. Again, the, the, the bizarre nature of the media covering this stuff is that Republicans are always bad and Democrats are always good. New York cases have multiplied times five on a daily basis since September, right? I just give you an October number. It was even lower in September. Okay, but don't worry, Democrats know what to do. They are setting new rules and it's exciting stuff. So Andrew Cuomo, the idiot governor of New York, who's presided over one of the worst death per million rates in the nation, he said yesterday that officers must 
must enforce COVID-19 laws. In fact, if you don't enforce a COVID-19 law and you're an officer and you, you refuse to do it, you're a dictator. So I think he doesn't understand a language that we call English, where dictators are people like, I don't know, who, who declare randomly that we should completely shut down an entire state's school district for no apparent reason. That seems more dictatorial than an officer saying, I'm not going to enforce mandates that seem to me to violate individual liberties. Nonetheless, according to, to Andrew Cuomo, it's the officers who are the dictators. I believe that law enforcement officer violates his or her constitutional duty. I don't consider them a law enforcement officer because you don't have the right to pick laws that you think you will enforce and you don't enforce laws that you don't agree with, right? That's not a law enforcement officer. Uh, that's a dictator. A dictator is the person who decides he doesn't want to enforce particular... Somebody should talk to Barack Obama about the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. I'm old enough to remember when that guy declared that he could simply disregard immigration law because he was a magical, magical man and he could use his pen and his phone to magically change law. Andrew Cuomo might want to talk to that guy about selective enforcement of law. Also, the good news for Andrew Cuomo is the rules don't apply to him. So he, uh, he announced, actually, on Monday that he would be spending Thanksgiving with his 89-year-old mother and his two daughters. That was exciting stuff. Here he was yesterday. The story is my mom is going to come up and two of my uh, girls is the current plan. But the plans change. Um, but that's my plan. That was his plan. You see, so he said, you can't have Thanksgiving with your family. You are one of the common folk. No Thanksgiving with your family. But you know who can have Thanksgiving with his 89-year-old mother and his two daughters? Wait, you know what I was told? I was told the intergenerational dinners that are filled with people eating turkey in a closed room. That's a bad idea. So he's got his 89-year-old mom and his two daughters, who last I checked, I believe, are in their 20s. And they're all in the same room together. And they're sharing dinner. Isn't that nice? He's having a Thanksgiving, guys. We can't begrudge it. I mean, he's been working hard at killing all the old folks in the state. He's been working super hard at writing a book about how wonderful he is while people die. He, like, he won an Emmy. We cannot begrudge him his Thanksgiving dinner. These standards do not apply to Andrew Cuomo. Okay, so he now revised that. Later in the day, his office issued a statement clarifying the plans have changed. His senior advisor, Rich as a party, told the Wall Street Journal, given the current circumstances with COVID, Cuomo will have to work through Thanksgiving. Oh, that, isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? By the way, he said on Sunday, quote, next Thanksgiving, you'll ask yourself, did I do everything I could to keep my community safe? The rules don't apply if you are a special. If you are a special, the rules simply do not apply to you. It's really exciting stuff. It, that's, that's really, really nice. And that, I mean, if you're Andrew Cuomo, you just can do whatever the hell you want. It's pretty great. If you're one of the commoners, however, you just get boned. If you're one of the commoners, then they can do whatever they want to you. So if you are an LA restaurant owner, then the entire state of California can, can be shut down for you. But Governor Gavin Newsom in California, that's you can still go to the French Laundry for a $20,000 dinner, 400 bucks a plate, 22 people there, including the heads of the California Medical Association. You can eat in close contact with no masks. But if you own a restaurant in LA County, you can lose your livelihood because you're not one of the specials. I mean, let's face it. There are the specials and the not so specials. If you're an elected Democrat, you're a member of the special cadre. If you're not an elected Democrat, you have no capacity to exercise your reason. And so the specials will decide for you. Here was an L.A. restaurant owner yesterday saying uh, these restrictions are going to literally destroy us. The biggest toll is going to we're going to have to lay off the people that we just brought back. or We're going to have to furlough them likely uh, as we downsize to a takeout only, which you know requires less kitchen, less front of house staff. So it's it, this influx is just... It's, it's about to break us all. Okay, so uh, we don't care about him, though. I mean, he's not, he's not a special guy. I mean, does he look special to you? I don't know if he's special. I mean, he's wearing a mask, which means he's better than, like, stupid Republicans. But, but he's, he's not special. He owns a business. We know people who own businesses are not special. Only people who are elected in order to spend other people's money and make crappy rules. Those people are the specials. Uh, I, I also will say that many of these rules make no sense at all, obviously. So Pennsylvania has now banned the sale of alcohol at bars and restaurants ahead of Thanksgiving. The administration of Democratic Governor Tom Wolf announced Monday, alcohol will be barred from being sold at restaurants and bars in Pennsylvania from Wednesday evening until Thanksgiving morning. An apparent edict intended to slow the spread of the China-originated novel coronavirus. This is according to DailyWire.com and Amanda Prestigiacomo reporting. Dr. Rachel Levine, the Secretary of Health for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, most famous for suggesting that nursing homes were safe only to remove mommy from a nursing home in the middle of the pandemic early on. Dr. Levine said on Wednesday, November 25th, restaurants and bars are ordered to suspend alcohol sales at 5 p.m. until 8 a.m. on Thursday, November 26th. Well, that's definitely going to stop this thing. I mean, it, as we all know, it is really the alcohol sales that are doing it. COVID does not apply so long as you're 
it, it's a very prudish virus. It's, a, it's both woke and prudish, which is a weird combo. So it'll only apparently hit you if you are a Republican or an Orthodox Jew. And also you can avoid it by not drinking alcohol. So that's exciting stuff. So I guess that Mormons are going to do okay with COVID is kind of the, the implication here. So it, that, that's, that's exciting stuff. There are also new mitigation measures in Pennsylvania, including targeted protections for businesses and gatherings. Orders already in place and those announced today will be enforced. Law enforcement and state agencies will be stepping up enforcement efforts, issuing citations and fines and possible regulatory actions for repeat offenders. So that, that is just excellent. Small business transaction data collected by software and business services provider Wompley show about one in five businesses open in January have stopped transacting entirely, according to the Wall Street Journal last month. Most of them have likely closed for good. But again, the good news is that, um, you know, if you're special, then probably you can ignore all of this. And meanwhile, I have to say the, the generalized perception that is put forth on COVID policy, the, the generalized line on COVID policy is so backwards. So Larry Hogan, the governor of Maryland, who is a Republican governor. I think that he has done a fairly good job as governor of Maryland. But he said yesterday something completely insane. He said that there is no constitutional right to walk around without a mask and that it's the equivalent of drunk driving. Here was Governor Hogan. Well, it's it's sort of like saying I have a constitutional right uh, to drive drunk. I have a constitutional right to not wear a seatbelt or to yell fire in a crowded movie theater uh, or to not follow the speed limit. Which part don't you understand? You wear the mask. It's, there's no constitutional right to walk around without a mask. So uh, a couple of things. It is not like drunk driving. If you're walking around without a mask and you are not symptomatic and you are not known to have this thing, it's like driving around sober. And now if you get close to other people and you breathe on them, that is a different thing. But walking around without a mask, there is in fact a constitutional right to walk around without a mask. It is just that at all times and all places, there are public health exceptions to constitutional rights. This happens all the time, right? There is a right to freedom of assembly, for example, right? That is a constitutional right to freedom of assembly. But there can be time, place, and manner regulations that prevent that from becoming a public health threat, for example. To suggest that there is no actual right to walk around without a mask is to suggest that the, it's an argument that proves too much. It's to suggest the government has at any time and for any reason the ability to tell you to put on a mask. So, so by that standard, the standard that if you are walking around and you have the possibility of making anybody else sick, no matter how remote or no matter what the disease, we can tell you to put on a mask full time. I, I'm wondering, how do you put that genie back in the bottle? At what point do we all stop wearing the masks? Now, my presumption has been that we're basically going to be wearing masks in close quarters until the wide adoption of the vaccine, presumably March and April. And that's okay. We can go back to our regular lives in March and April. And before then, we can go back to quasi-normal by going to work, socially distancing, wearing masks in close quarters with others. But the, the baseline notion that the government has the right under all circumstances to tell you what to do with cloth on your face seems wild to me, crazy to me, especially when they're not abiding by their own rules. This is... This has gone beyond the point of reason, especially with regard to a, a virus that in certain areas is not actually threatening the healthcare capacity of the state. The healthcare capacity of Florida, which is being ripped up and down, Florida, right, Ron DeSantis is a bad guy. There is not an overwhelming of the healthcare system in Florida. I'm talking to doctors every day who are working in ERs. There is not an overwhelming of the healthcare system. I talked to an emergency room nurse just a couple of days ago. She said, it's getting worse than it was a month ago, but it's not nearly what it was you know, during the summer when we had this vast uptick in Florida, for example. Nonetheless, there's this basic idea that is constantly being promoted by the media, and that is the government is the problem, is the solution to all ills. Simply by interpolating particular regulations, they can stop things. Simply by ordering you to wear a mask, all, all problems will be solved. And if you refuse to comply with the ultimate power of government, it's because you are stupid or because you are bad or because you rely too much in individual freedom. Well, if you don't rely enough on individual freedom, I would say that is significantly more of a problem. All righty, we'll be back here later today with two additional hours of content. Otherwise, we'll see you here tomorrow. I'm Ben Shapiro. This is The Ben Shapiro Show. The Ben Shapiro Show is produced by Colton Haas. Executive producer, Jeremy Boring. Our supervising producers are Mathis Glover and Robert Sterling. Production manager, Pavel Wydowski. Our associate producers are Nick Sheehan and Rebecca Doyle. The show is edited by Adam Saievitz. Audio is mixed by Mike Coromina. Hair and makeup is by Nika Geneva. The Ben Shapiro Show is a Daily Wire production. Copyright Daily Wire 2020. The Trump administration begins the transition process. Joe Biden names John Kerry the climate czar. And HBO wants to trans your kids. Check it out on The Michael Knowles Show. Hold up. 